So if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Jude, the second last book of the New Testament. And uh, certainly short uh, is not a, a long book, not exhaustive in that sense, but packs a lot of punch in a short little epistle. And uh, the rate we're progressing at the moment, I thought tonight we'd take a couple of verses, because I think up until this point, we've been kind of working verse by verse, literally a verse a week, which wasn't my intention. Um, But as I sat down to prepare the notes that I wanted to share tonight, I feel like we probably will reserve the majority of our time for verse four. So we're going to open up at verse one and read from verse one through to verse four. I think that helps us to gain the broader context of what verse four is going to communicate to us. And then we're going to uh, dive into the Word and see how God would speak to us tonight. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith That was once for all delivered to the saints. Now here's our key focus for tonight. Verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer and just ask his blessing upon this study of his word tonight. Father, we thank you for your good grace upon us. Thank you for your gift of scripture. Thank you, Lord God, that you inspired your prophets and apostles to write this holy, glorious, sufficient and inerrant word. Lord God, may we humbly approach it. May we allow it to speak its fullness to us. May we order our lives and regulate our thoughts and actions and words by what we learn herein. And above all, God, may Christ be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 4 talks about certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. That is one densely packed verse. There is a lot in that. And at this juncture in the book of Jude, we're beginning to get the identification of who are these malcontents that have infiltrated the church? How have they infiltrated it? What's their motivation? What's their intentions? And what can we learn about them and how to identify them and to earnestly contend? We read this in the opening line, for certain people ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality, which means some of your translations will actually say license. They, they're taking advantage of God's goodness and His benevolence. In fact, I would even argue that what we're reading here is an over-exaggeration of a God of just, you know, a God of a con- continual love. God is never angry. God is never wrathful. God is never really quite just God. He really just wants to continue this never ending fountain of His love and His grace and His favor and His mercy and His goodness. And it's always God's will that you have everything that you could possibly have that's the, the best thing for you and, and, and your wants and your needs. God's just there. And at some point, uh, through this description, of God, you've kind of contorted the image of God that Scripture gives us, and you've established a God who really, you've heard me say this before, looks a lot more like Santa Claus than the God of the Bible. There's, a, there's an intentional omission and a forgetting about God's wrath, God's holiness, God's justness. And I think that in our day and age, in this generation, this really is where theology is suffering its greatest downgrade, is to see predominantly rethinking who God is, relinquishing the Bible's place of supremacy to dictate to us who God is. It's no longer the Word that describes God to us, but rather it tends to be our imaginations that can conjure up with an image of God, that that better coheres to a, a new age spiritual view of a deity like a mother earth or something like that and has very little, if anything, in common with the God 
of the Bible. So the Bible no longer has its prime of place in dictating to us. I'm using that verb intentionally. God spoke, and when God spoke, he spoke about who he is, what he is, how he intends to reign and rule, how he wants to administer his grace and his justice. And God's not left any of this up for our own imagination. He's spoken explicitly and continuously in the scriptures. But we do see and we can tell that these words of Jude, like what an, what an apt description that these malcontents who want to do nothing but harm inside churches, their ambition is to take the grace of God, because God is gracious, don't mishear me tonight. God is tremendously gracious. God's grace is continual. His love is poured out. God is ever merciful. But at the same time, those kinds of doctrines and ideas need to be balanced by the scriptural view of God's justice, His wrath. And we do see in churches today this allowance to let the culture dictate who God is, relegating the word to a place of auxiliary authority. You won't find many churches that just openly say, we don't care about the Bible, we're not interested in the Bible, we don't let the Bible speak, but... You can tell that they've taken the Bible and they've, they've just shuffled it down a few places in primacy in who is allowed to dictate the truth. And I think for the most part, now maybe you're sitting there thinking, that's surely an exaggeration. And it's possible that some people think that. They think that, that maybe I'm an alarmist and I'm drawing a really grim picture and, and it's, a little bit, it's a, just a little bit too morbid to really reflect reality. But I want to offer this challenge. If you happen to be thinking to yourself, that must be hyperbole. I want to offer you this challenge. Go on campus, our local campus here in Nacogdoches, and introduce yourself to people as a believer and discover how many people will introduce themselves in return as a believer. You, you will actually maybe be amazed to find, I've been there many, many times myself on campus, you'll struggle to meet someone who is, you know, an, an outright outspoken atheist. Everybody's got a church background. Everybody comes from a Christian tradition, some way, shape, or form. And then pose this second question. Pose this second question. How do you believe, or on what grounds is your confidence that this God of Scripture is going to allow you to enter His heaven? And then just let them talk. Don't, don't feed them. Just let them describe their view of the grace of God. And pretty quickly you will see that the predominant view, even among millennials, if we want to use that generational appellation, people from 18 to 25 right now have grown up in church environments that have dictated this view of God that is not exactly akin with Scripture. And the predominant view that you will find is that God's just that, God's just that good of a God. That I'm going to arrive at the pearly gates and when I knock and say, let me in, God's going to say, well, I am after all loving without limit. I am after all gracious without resistance. I am so merciful. And what we find is that people don't ever think about this reality that this God in the Bible, this God in the Bible that gives his love lavishly, and indeed he does, and his grace he gives in Christ, is the same God that swamps the world in a global flood of judgment, is the same God that, that destroys the firstborn all throughout Egypt and then in one, in one catastrophe ruins the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. I'll digress just for a moment. I was listening to a Bible scholar, contemporary, I won't mention his name, although I'm not trying to protect his identity. This, this guy said something that was laughable to me. He he said that when we look at the miracle of the crossing of the Red Sea, maybe some of you have heard this before, it was kind of new for me, so I got, I got a good laugh out of it. When we read in the Bible that the Israelites, the, the slaves that had now been freed, were, were fleeing the Egyptians, it wasn't the Red Sea that they uh, crossed through on dry land, it was the, the Reed Sea. There's, there's apparently another sea somewhere nearby, whether it's true or imaginary, I couldn't tell you. But it's a Reed Sea, it's, it's less than a foot deep, and when a hard wind blows, it tends to dry up. Have you ever heard this before? This, this amazing example of how the great miracle of God actually dividing a legitimate sea, turning that into just a strong west wind blowing and drying up a, a reed sea. And it boils down to nothing more than really just a typo in your Bible. That's what you have. Don't fret about it. But then you begin to wonder, the greater miracle still remains. How did God destroy the entire Egyptian army, chariots and all, in one foot deep of water? How did they drown so thoroughly when this west wind blew? The whole thing becomes idiotic. Now, of course, I, I, I wouldn't say that that guy's having a massive amount of influence on the Christian world today. 
But a downgrade is very clear. And I think that some of the reason, I won't ascribe the entire reason behind this, but some of it is a lack of or a departure of exegetical exposition of Scripture in what we call today sermons. It's easy for any of us to jump online. In fact, maybe as, a, as an experiment, you could do this in the back end of your week. You could jump online and uh, Google maybe the, the top 10, top 20 biggest churches in, uh, in our state, Texas. You know, there's, there's hundreds and, and maybe even thousands of churches in Texas that number in the thousands. This is kind of a mega church home. Everything is bigger in Texas. You, of course, know that uh, we are here in this wonderful land. And, and find these churches and then just, just do this, a simple experiment, and, uh, and go to their websites or, or their podcasting or their YouTube channel or social media and just download their most recent sermon that they've uploaded for the, the viewing and the listening public to hear. And then listen to it critically with, with, with the eyes of examination of Scripture to ask the question whether this truly is the exposition of the Word of God or is this also predominantly the thoughts, the whims, the ideas of a very charismatic, gifted, powerful speaker. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think as we see this downgrade in our modern day, drifting away from the faithful exposition of Scripture, the exegetical study of Scripture, which usually means verse by verse through books of the Bible, take them as a whole, study them as a whole, treat them as the final authority, and, and from those verses of God's Word, juice out of them all of their implication and glorious doctrine for us. We see a downgrade. I don't, want to, I don't want to speak about it in ways that tends to undermine or undercut. This is simply a reality. It tends to be because I believe there is a lack of exposition. Because what happens is, when you're teaching through the Bible verse by verse, passage by passage, just as God inspired it through His holy prophets and apostles, then you have to teach hard things. You have to come up against verses and ideas and concepts and applications that normally you probably, as a preacher, I'll speak for myself, you normally want to kind of shy away from it. You don't want to deal with these things and confront them often, but when you're teaching through books of the Bible, you're letting the Bible be its own order as to when doctrines, ideas, and applications arise. And all this coming back to this line that Jude uses, he describes these malcontents as people who convert the grace of God into licentiousness. They, they take the grace of God, they take the truth of God's goodness, His love, His patience, His mercy, and they convert that into, I can live however I want, because after all, God's going to lavish me with blessing anyway, because He's just that good a God. That is not the truth of Scripture. That is not the Gospel. What happens then is that modern day Christians find themselves in circumstances where they squirm at so-called atrocities of Scripture. I've mentioned a few already. So-called atrocities of Scripture. Because those events clearly don't agree with postmodern assessments of God. What's a postmodern assessment of God? Well, Jude has given it to us two millennia ago. Not very modern at all. That God is all grace. That our sin isn't so consequential. That God's wrath is a myth from preachers of bygone eras. It's kind of like you think about this scenario when Moses is up on Mount Sinai. You remember this story. Receiving from God the Ten Commandments. In other words, receiving from God his very inspired, inerrant word. Getting from God the Scripture. And while he's doing that, what's happening down in the congregation of Israel? They are concocting for themselves a God that they would rather choose to worship than the one true God of glory. And you have to get a, you have to get a visual sense of what's going on. While Moses is up on the mountain, we read the record in, in Exodus that the whole mountain is, is, is wrapped in this glorious, threatening, thundering, lightning and, and dark cloud. And the people are terrified and that's still going on, but they've just, they've just grown used to it. They've just become accustomed to it. They're not, they're not affected by it. There's no, there's no inner soul affliction. They're inoculated against the fear of God. What initially confronted them in their sin has become an everyday event. And they're not bothered or concerned. And while Moses is getting from God his word, they're already at the bottom of the mountain breaking the first of the two of the Ten Commandments. And of course, they fashion this golden idol this um this false god the judgment of god comes upon them swiftly 
If we convert that scenario into postmodern times, there, there are preachers preaching truth. And I don't mean to imply if you conducted the experiment I proposed earlier and you found the, the, the top 10 or top 20 biggest, most outwardly or on the surface seemingly successful churches, that it's all going to be bad. That's not my argument. That's not my case. But you will find a pattern will begin to emerge. You'll find that it tends to be with more and more compromise there's a greater deal of attractiveness to the unbelieving world because the Word of God is further and further and further away from people's consciences to afflict them inwardly and to cause them to realize that yes, God is grace and yet our sin still remains a big deal. It still remains consequential. And so, although we see this today, postmodern times in our culture, in our era... There are still faithful people who proclaim the word. Maybe they do it from pulpits. Maybe they do it in churches. Maybe they do it on street corners. Maybe they do it online. It doesn't matter where they do it. They're faithful to scripture. And yet we see a culture around us who quickly prefer a harmless idol instead. That is to convert the grace of God into license for sin. Licentiousness. What else does Jude say? He gives us a sense of their intention. That's, that's their goal. Their goal is to tame God to make God vastly more palatable and less threatening than He's revealed Himself in Scripture, and they've crept in unnoticed. That's what Jesus says. In other words, they don't belong in the church, but they've found their way in. They've wormed their way in. They've come secretly with every intention of doing harm. And they're not trying to be spotted. Don't, don't read this in Jude and think, well, then they're going to be obvious. They're going to stand out like a sore thumb. We're all going to see who they are and we're all going to know. And it's going to be, hey, man, get out of here. You don't belong. Jude told us to earnestly contend and we pat ourselves on the back. We've done our duty. These people have crept in. There's a, there's, there's a surreptitiousness about their intention to be unnoticed, to be secret. And yet, of course, to have intentions that are dire and grim. They're not trying to be spotted. They're not trying to be supportive. They feel like they're doing a service to the church. They feel like they're actually helping. You remember that Jesus taught this, that this would go to the nth degree. This would reach its zenith. And people, even in latter times, will kill Christians assuming that they're doing Jesus and God a favor. That's how, that's how inconsistent the thinking will become. Well, these people will creep in cleverly. They'll creep in secretly, unnoticed. They're not going to immediately be obvious, but they're going to get inside. They're not going to support, but they're going to believe that they're there for the betterment of the church. That the church is, the church is thankful or ought to be thankful to have them. They're, after all, God sent. They're trying to bring the gospel and the word of God into question. They're going to offer seemingly harmless modifications to the very word of God and the description that God gives of himself. When God inspires scripture, he gives us his unquestioned revelation. He has spoken. He has clarified. He has declared who he is. It is, the, it is the pinnacle of being unbecoming of created entities like any of us, no matter how smart we are or educated we are or how good theologians or philosophers or metaphysicians we feel like we are. It is entirely unbecoming for us to alter or modify God's declaration of himself in any way. Even if we think, well, that's all the unbelieving world needs. If we just kind of tone it down a little bit. That's what we need to do. We need to just tone it down. You know, we, enough of all this Old Testament and, and wrath and vengeance and, and all this kind of blood and gore. And I've heard people say this even about the cross. We don't want anyone teaching about the cross as, a, as an implement of torture and execution. Well, then, frankly, you don't want the cross at all. It's not much else. That's what it is. It is the place where criminals go to die, and most gloriously, where the God-man went to atone for the sins of those who receive him. So there's this assumption that they've come into the church unspotted, undetected, and they've done a good job at doing that, and they're there to help. They're there to offer their assistance. And they'll often present themselves that way. You're glad I'm here. You should be thankful I'm here. I'm here to do a service. I'm just here to make some minor modifications and it's going to make the gospel more palatable. The next thing Jude says about these people is they were designated for destruction long ago. This is a challenging phrase. Designated for destruction long ago. 
This is challenging because I actually, I actually don't think that's the best way to translate this phrase in the Greek. Now, I rarely take exception with the English Standard Version. I think it is among the absolute best English translation. It's not the only great translation, but it is certainly among the best as a literal, predominantly word-for-word rendering of the ancient Hebrew and the Koine Greek into our modern vernacular. It simply is. But in this instance, I feel like the translation could be a little better. And so you have every right to say, well, Craig, on earth are you? Correct. I I receive that criticism well, I understand it, but let me make a case for you. I'm actually going to appeal to the NIV. Some of you use the NIV, some of you enjoy the NIV. I'm not as prone to turn to the NIV. I don't don't hate it, I'm not against it, I'm not anti-NIV. I think there are places where it is brilliant. And this happens to be one of those places. Let me read this whole verse, verse 4 of Jude 1 in the NIV and show you how Jude renders this phrase. Then I'm going to give you the Greek and upon giving you the Greek, I'm going, to, I'm going to allow us all to be, just for a few moments, translators. And we're going to see where we end up. For certain individuals, this is the NIV, Jude 1.4, whose condemnation was written about long ago, secretly have slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the, tru- the, who pervert the grace of God into license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign Lord. So in that you detected the difference. The phrase in the NIV is, whose condemnation was written about long ago. I'm going to offer two reasons why I think that's what Jude was initially getting at and why those English translations that have phrases like the ESV does, and don't misunderstand me, the ESV is not wrong. It just opens a doorway for ideas that I don't think are indigenous to Jude. An ESV designed for destruction or designated for destruction long ago. In the NIV, we have their condemnation was written about long ago. Now, the word here in the ESV that's designated in the Greek is prographe. Very simple, graphe. Graphe is just the Greek word, one of the most common Greek words for writing. It's also the word for scripture. Whenever you read the word scripture, not whenever, but usually, like Paul writes to Timothy, all scripture is God breathed, it's inspired, that word is graphe. That's, a, that's the common way that this word is utilized in English. Graphe is either scripture or writing. So I would say that the most natural rendering of prographe is written about long ago, as the NIV renders it. But you may say that's not a very strong case because you've got, I don't know, dozens of professional translators and scholars sitting on the English Standard Version Translational Committee who all know Greek far better than any of us. That's true. But not only do I think just because the word graphe is better here rendered writing, but because that's exactly what we see Jude do, don't we? In other words, in other words, when Jude says this, that their condemnation was written about long ago, when he says that, he then spends the next, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 verses bringing up examples from the Old Testament and even extra biblical literature like the book of Enoch, so on and so forth, to show how the condemnation for these malcontents in the church has already been written about. In other words... Jude doesn't just use the word graphe to resemble writing. He then appeals predominantly to the writings of the Old Testament. One commentator, one commentator said this, if I can find this particular quote, one commentator offers this clarification that, that the reality is Jude continues to work through all these examples, nine Old Testament examples, unbelieving Israel, Fallen angels, Sodom and Gomorrah, the archangel Michael, Moses, Cain, Balaam, Korah, and Enoch. Nine examples. Nine examples. All of those examples are derived predominantly or Old Testament or extra biblical literature. Writings. So I think the NIV gets this best because this phrase, their their, their condemnation as designated for destruction long ago, is better rendered written about. And I think that's what Jude wants us to do. He wants us to do a thorough Old Testament study of the way in which God deals with people who will remain in a state of unbelief all the while have been given every advantage to surrender, repent, and believe in God. They reject. They reject. They turn away. Examples like Cain, fallen angels, citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, Satan interacted with the archangel Michael or Balaam or Korah or Enoch's prophecy that in the end he shall come with ten thousands of his 
saints. That's my case. That's why I think the NIV renders this phrase best. I don't think there is a case here for any kind of speculating that God, and I I know theologians that have done this, theologians that I believe are very gifted and very sound, have used this verse to sort of annex some kind of a a double predestination view that, that, that of course God has in eternity past decreed who He will save and they'll use this verse to say all those that God will condemn, He has another book, not of life but of death and He's written all their names out and He's pursuing their destruction. I don't, I don't believe that. I don't think the Bible communicates that. I don't think Jude is in any way remotely referencing that. We are way off track here. Let's get back to Jude. This word designated, prographe, written about. Jude begins to lean heavily on the Old Testament literature, extra biblical writings to demonstrate the the prographe. Jude asserts this point, makes a strong case. This is the application we need. Now, what do we learn from that? That Jude is predominantly thinking about the Old Testament and literature surrounding the Old Testament, maybe apocryphal sources. What do we learn from that? that we should apply that in a certain sense and we should all be better at understanding the Old Testament. We should all be better theologians when it comes to the New Testament. In fact, I want to read you something here that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10. Let me read a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. For they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened. This is verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. These things happened as examples for us. So that we would not crave evil things as they craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction." upon whom the ends of the ages has come. I think that's what Jude's trying to do. Jude is attempting, whether Jude knew of this epistle to the Corinthians or not, we know it because it is canonized as scripture. We should be better theologians and better historians than those who understand and apply the Old Testament. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians 10. This happened so that... We would learn, we would understand, we would have a good framework for knowing how God rules and reigns and administers His grace. Let me, let me race to something of a, a summary here of what we've seen in this verse before us. The true church of Christ that earnestly contends for gospel truth will be under attack, will be, not might be, will be under attack by certain or particular people who surreptitiously seek the downfall of the church. That's, that's the summary of this. Now, the, the marks of these people are constant. And even though we've said these people have crept in unnoticed, that's their goal is to not be made, not be detected. Jude gives us plenty of descriptors that we can say these are criteria for who these certain harmful people might be. Ungodly people, perverting the grace of God in sensuality, denying the only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Further on in Jude, we read they rely on their dreams, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, blaspheme glorious ones. That's that's verse 8. We read in verse 10, they blaspheme all they don't understand, destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. We read on that they're grumblers, they're malcontents, they follow their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. That's verse 16. So Jude wants us to be aware of these particular criteria. And I don't think Jude is arguing that in order for someone to be, to be made as a danger to the church whom Jude wants us to be earnestly contending for, they have to fit all of that criteria, but a good number of them will do. These kinds of personalities. We read that their goal must not be underestimated. Their far-reaching agenda must be acknowledged. 
What do we read in verse 12 of Jude? They are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you. Can you picture the graphic nature of that, of that analogy? Of course, uh, maritime travel has advanced significantly in 2,000 years. Back in this day and age of the first century, hidden reefs were, they were the death knell of any particular sailor on the sea. And it says that they're hidden reefs at your love feast. They're already in the church. They're consuming food with you, sitting beside you, enjoying fellowship. We are called to be intolerant of them. We are called to properly recognize that their presence represents a grave threat to the gospel. And it's in the midst of this that we must be on alert. We must be. Now, don't think it can't happen to you. Don't think it can't happen in your church. Don't think it hasn't happened before. Don't even think it's rare. Be aware of this fact, and this is simply a a secular statistic that any of you could go and Google and arrive at this number. That on average, every year in the United States alone, 4,000 churches close their door permanently. 4,000 every year. In fact, this year, 2020, because of COVID issues and lockdown and other, other contingencies that have had grave effects upon ministers and churches, and it's a lot more. I've, I've heard a recent person who works directly in this kind of ministry of revitalization, he speculated that this year it'll cap 8,000 churches shutting their door permanently. Don't, don't think this is kind of a non-event. Like Jude, well, he's a bit of an alarmist. Don't think that, well, Craig, you choosing to teach through this book, it seems a little bit unnecessary. We're a good church. We're a strong church. We'll be fine. They won't come in here. That's not how we understand or interpret Jude's admonition to us. We're going to close. Before we do, I just want to do one more reading. This reading is a little bit long, but I feel like this would really help us to encapsulate all that we're reading here in Jude. I think most of us are aware of Second Peter chapter 2 conveys a lot of Jude's concepts. Second Peter chapter 2, there are some parts of it that are literally word for word what Jude wrote. There, there are debates in the scholarly literature, which one came first, who plagiarized who, we don't exactly know, and it's not that important. Both of these records are inerrant, infallible scripture, but Peter adds detail where Jude doesn't. I think Peter would be good to read, just by way of closing. If you want to turn with me to Second Peter chapter 2. I do believe this will help us to just mentally frame all that we as believers commanded to contend that we're up against. Let me read it. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. 2 Peter 2 verse 2. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as they wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deception while they feast with you. 
They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts ruined in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human restrained the prophet's madness. They are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity this evening to gather around your word. To seek you to speak to us, Lord God, with all the authority that you are and have through your infallible, glorious record of Scripture. Help us to always recognize our need to be servants of the Word and never masters over it. Help us, Lord God, to always read it with humility, contriteness, and a real sense of awe and reverence that you have so gifted your people with this wonderful gift of the Word. Help us to love it. Help us to have an insatiable appetite to consume it, to know it, to apply it to our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.